on diseases. Mm -hmm. This wasn't just a random decision made. This was a very carefully thought out list of rules for why we name diseases the way we name them now. Yep. Major. Number three. Another important thing we learned. This is not the flu. I mean, we knew that. We knew that. Especially if you listened to uh, chapter two. But this has been some people still saying this in the media. (laughs) Some people (laughs) in the U.S. So the infection that SARS-CoV-2 can cause, the disease we know of as COVID-19, so far as we can tell, has a higher case fatality rate, even in the best case scenarios that we've seen so far. It also has a much higher hospitalization rate. And we've talked so many times that a large part of the need to flatten the curve is to reduce the strain on our healthcare systems. Because if people can't get in to seek medical care if they get really ill, or if people can't go to the hospital for any other reasons because the hospitals are full of COVID-19 patients, then this crisis becomes even more controllable and tragic. And... Unlike influenza, we don't have any immunity to this virus whatsoever. If you have ever gotten the flu or ever gotten your flu shot, which of course all of our listeners are up to date on their flu shots, then you have the potential, at least some ability, to fight off a new influenza infection. You have some kind of immunity. But with this, we've got nothing. Number four on our list of things that we can take away from this conversation is that we currently are and have been for a long time under-resourced for an outbreak like this and this outbreak in particular, even here in the U.S. And this has direct implications on just how bad an outbreak gets. So we need to continue to invest in communication, coordination, and surveillance efforts, not only early on in outbreaks, but all the time, so that we can pick up on outbreaks early enough in the process to really be able to prevent these kinds of events in the future. Emergency preparedness, global health security, but on national and international scales, it's something that we need to invest more in. And this is something that we talked about Even in that very first coronavirus episode back in early February, this is something that epidemiologists and people who work in international health have been saying for years and years and years, we need more funding. Yeah. Because especially in countries that may not have the resources to do the surveillance that is necessary to detect novel or emerging pathogens, like I think as as Dr. Kapali says... Our international public health is only as strong as the weakest link. Mm -hmm. And we all need to strengthen that because otherwise we have something that is going to spill over time and time again. And as I said in the first coronavirus episode, this is not a new pattern. This is not something Mm -hmm. that has a unique event. This is something that has happened before and very much has the potential to happen again, but with a different virus that once again, we are unprepared and un able to detect or test or treat. Exactly. The last thing, number five, and I think the most important takeaway points from probably any of our episodes, we've said it before, we all have a social responsibility at this point to do what we can to help prevent the spread of this infection. This isn't someone else's problem. This is all of our problems. And we all have the ability to help in some capacity. Staying home that's helping. Because the thing is, not everyone can stay home. Our healthcare workers are on the front line. Slug we don't to work every day, but literally putting their bodies in between this infection and the rest of the world. And it's not only healthcare workers. Lots of people have to keep going to work in order for us all to be able to survive, right? People who work at grocery stores, emergency services, public transit, food production. These people have to be out and going to work. Well done! Is that for so many people, staying home 